Greetings all saints. Today I want to speak about a topic that is often referred to. Revival. We very often hear of people asking for revival, praying for revival, speaking about revival, saying here is a revival, there is a revival. Is this a revival? And so today I want to give some clarity on the matter. Today's message is for those who are seekers of the truth. I can guarantee that those who are not seekers of the truth would probably be offended. What does it mean to be revived? What is the conditions required for a revival to be needed? What does the word revive mean? Well, it means to restore to life from a depressed, inactive, or unused state. So, basically, for something to be revived, its condition needs to be that of death. It needs to have died. Or it has lost its life, its effectiveness, its usefulness, and it needs a new newness of life. So how does God bring about revival? The term is not a term often referred to in, in scripture, but it is something that Christians speak about quite commonly. So if we look at at an example of the pouring out of the Spirit of God. A revival is normally associated with uh, a fire being poured out. And uh, we have to look then at what happened in Acts 2 when there was a pouring out of the Spirit of God. And a pouring out of fire, so to speak. So many people, when they speak of the word revival, they actually use the term revival of fire or fire revival. But before that took place, let's consider what happened 53 days before and the days leading up to that. So 53 days, because of course we know that for 10 days the disciples were waiting upon that which the Lord said would happen uh, in the upper room. For 40 days, Jesus was walking around on earth in a glorified body and there were over 500 witnesses that can attest to that fact that he was walking around in this body. And then, of course, there were the three days that Jesus was in the tomb. So, what happened before that? Which brought about the condition that required revival. What happened was that Israel rejected the promise that God had said would come. Through Israel, God said the promise would come. They rejected the promise and they crucified Christ. And that then marked the end of Israel's role as the people of promise. The role of Israel, and God said he would preserve Israel through all the times that God uh, would want to wipe them out and destroy them. He said he would preserve them. In fact, that's why he gave the law to preserve Israel. The law meted out um, just 
measures of uh, punishment or um, retru the retribution for specific acts or trespasses so that he didn't have to wipe them out. He didn't have to kill them. So the law was part of preserving Israel. But why was Israel preserved? So that Israel would bring forth the promise. The promise, as we know, the seed is Christ himself. Once Israel rejected Christ and crucified him, Israel now no longer has the role of being the people of promise. The promise came, the promise was rejected, and Israel would never again be God's chosen people. The purpose of Israel, for all intents and purposes, is now dead. So the state and the condition of Israel is that it is dead. As a spiritual body, no more use, useless. And in fact, Romans addresses this. If you want to read through the passages, Romans 9, 10, and 11, he addresses this and he quotes Hosea in Romans 9, verse 25 and 26. As he says in Hosea, will call them my people. God will call them my people who are not my people. And I will call her my beloved who is not my beloved. And it will happen that in the very place where it was said to them, you are not my people, they will be called sons of the living God. Verse 27. Isaiah cries out concerning Israel, Though the number of the Israelites is like the sand of the sea, only the remnant will be saved. We can go on reading through those passages in chapter 8 from verse 5 to 8. It says, In the same way, at the present time, there is a remnant chosen by grace. And if it is by grace, then it is no longer by works. Otherwise, grace would no longer be grace. What then? What Israel was seeking, it failed to obtain, but the elect did. The others were hardened, as it is written, God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes that could not see, and ears that could not hear, to this very day. So what happened is that Israel rejected Christ, but the writer of the book of Romans says, does that mean God has forgotten Israel? No, no, there will be a remnant. Remember this word remnant, because in discussing revival, the remnant is very important. God's chosen people, God's holy nation, is now not the nation of Israel. It is the sons of God, born of the Spirit of God, the sons of faith, who are assembled into the Spirit of Christ, out of every nation, tribe, and tongue. Out of Israel too, but only a remnant, not the nation of Israel. So the first condition for revival is one must recognize that the thing that needs to be revived is dead. That's the condition. It's dead. And you must recognize it's dead in speaking about revival. Now, God doesn't restore the old life of Israel back to Israel. No, he doesn't revive the old. He brings forth the new. And so revival brings forth a new form of life. It doesn't restore or revive in that sense the old form or the old life. 
And scripture is very clear that the principle of a seed falling into the ground is that the seed dies. And that which goes into the ground, that is one form of life. The life that emerges out of that death that takes place when the seed dies is a different form. The nature of the resurrected life is a different nature to that which was before, which had to die. So the form of life that goes into the ground is not the same form of life that comes up out of it. It's a different form of life. John 12 verse 24. In fact, Jesus was saying this just shortly before he was crucified. And he says, truly, truly, I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a seed. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. The fruit does not look like the seed. It is a different form of life. It looks very different to that which died. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 42 to 45 says, Regarding the resurrection of the dead, what is sown is perishable. It is raised imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. So it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam, a life-giving spirit. So we see here the two forms of life, the natural and the spiritual, the perishable and the imperishable, the shadow, so to speak, and the true life that emerges. Israel was of the natural body. God has now assembled us into Christ as the body of Christ, a spiritual body. And so the life, that is comes out of that which had to die is a different form of life so here it is when you are asking for revival when you are praying for revival you first need to recognize that what you have the form you have the system you are in the institution or denomination that you are in that group that is asking or praying for revival, you must recognize it is by your own recognition certifiably dead. It has lost its life. It has lost its usefulness. It has lost its ability to function for that which is God's purposes. And so you are praying for revival. You can't pray for revival if you want to hold on to that which you are in, that which you have, the forms and the structures and the institutions and the traditions, and you get to hold on to that for dear life while praying for revival as if God is going to revive that form of life. He's not going to do it. He's going to bring a newness of life, the God life, the resurrection life, but it looks very different from that which you are in. It looks very different from that which you've been holding on to. It looks very different from that which you might have been protecting and defending and feeding and holding on to for dear life. God has not, nor will God ever restore life to an old form whose time has come. When that thing has served its purpose, there might have been a time God used it for his purposes. There might have been a season in which God used that form and that structure, that institution, those things that you are holding on to now religiously. There might have been a time when God used it, but it is now past its usefulness. It's past its sell-by date. It has expired. It has died. 
And God will not restore that thing again. He's not restoring that form of life. He's bringing a new form of life. The old thing, the old form must be done away with. And your, your affections to those things need to be dealt with and be done away with if you are indeed praying for revival. In its very essence, you are saying, I'm willing to let go of those things that I've set my affections to. Those things that are inaccurate representations of who Christ is. Those things that are traditions of men. Those things that maybe have been good. Those institutions, those structures, those traditions, those rituals, those forms, those denominations. Those things might have served its purpose. It might have been good in its season. But if you hold on to it and your affections are tied to it, you cannot pray for revival. And even if you do, you will not be part of what God revives. The form of life that used to exist must be done away with. And what God revives is then a new form of life. The life revival brings will not prolong the life of your systems. It will not extend the life of your programs and your doctrines and your traditions and your institutions. Nor will it make them look better and attract people to them. That's not what God is doing and he will never bring his new wine into those old wineskins. Those old structures, those old traditions, those affiliations that you were so protective of have to give way to a newness of life, a new form of life. So that's the first point. You must recognize for revival to come, the old has to die. It's a condition for revival. You don't revive that which is alive. You revive that which is dead. And the life that comes out of it is a new form of life. Here's another truth. That the majority do not make the transition. The majority that are in the old structures, in the old forms, in the old institutions, in the old traditions, the majority will not migrate into the new thing that God is doing, into the new season. They'll hear the messages, it'll go over their head. Even if they say, oh, those are good messages, Peter, you're preaching such good messages, they will not migrate because they're holding on to that which they knew, which they love, which they have their affections tied to, rather than the truth. Rather than the truth. They want to hold on to their denominations and their institutions and their systems. It's always only a remnant. And you'll see this in scripture very clearly, even in the passage that I read to you already. It is the remnant of Israel. A remnant that will come into the new form of life. And that new form of life looks very different to the form of life of what had to die. And that's why many will not transition. It's not going to preserve your old thing or make it look better. God is bringing something new that looks different to what you had. It's revival. And if you're praying for revival, or if your group or your institution or your denomination is claiming to have revival, then what in fact you're saying or admitting to is that your thing is dead. Now I know there's been things on the news and on television, social media that have said this is revival. And this one particular denomination had a Bible school and that everyone said this is revival. I'm telling you, that denomination, if it's saying this is revival, is saying certifiably, we as a denomination are dead. We are useless. We are past our expiry date. And what God needs to bring forth is destroy or bring to an end that which we've held on to so long. 
as our denomination and bring forth something new, if indeed it is a revival. Because revival comes only to those who are seeking truth, regardless of the cost. You're willing to walk away from the old. You're willing to walk away from that which you invested in and that you had going and that you had even established so well. And even were the experts in the field of doing. That's why it's called an establishment. Institution is an establishment because it's been established. People have invested in it. In fact, they've given their life, their sweat, their tears, their money, their time, their effort to build this thing, to establish it because we thought that's what God was pleased in. If we just build this system bigger, build this church bigger, build this denomination, build this institution, and we get a hold on to it for all we're worth because we built it for God. And surely he must, he must bless this thing. Those people that hold on to it will not see the revival that's coming because they are not seeking truth. And they're not willing to walk away from the old. Not willing to let go of the old. If you're not, you will not be part of what God does through revival because he will kill the old thing he'll let it die not that he's going to come and kill it it dies because he removes his presence from it and when that happens that thing will die and you that's holding on to that system that structure that institution those traditions you will die along with it and in it but we are not holding on to those things. We are holding on to Christ. We are baptized into Christ. Romans 6 verse 4 says, We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death. In order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may walk in a newness of life. There's a death that we need to be buried and baptized into. The death of ourselves, the death not only of a sinful nature, but anything that we've held on to, that we've invested in so much that we said, surely, surely God, you're not, you, you, you're not asking us to let go of this. The death is being willing to walk away from that and say, I am baptized into Christ. I'm baptized into death. To self, death to my own systems, my own ways, my own desire of how this thing turns out, even if I build this ministry, even if I build this denomination, even if I built this institution. You know, my family was part of building a denomination many, many years ago. They were the founding fathers of a denomination. But a time came when God said, I'm doing something new. And if you get a hold on to that to preserve what you've built, you will miss it. And many have missed it through the years and will continue to miss it as God brings about a revival for the remnant that are seeking truth. But if you refuse to acknowledge the useless nature of what you're trying to preserve, either institutionally or even personally in your own life, that thing that you're trying to preserve, that thing that is lifeless and falls short of the glory of God, if you are trying to hold on to that and refuse to acknowledge the nature of that is not Christ on display accurately, then you will not see revival. You must be baptized into a death to let go of all of those things. So, in short, don't pray for revival if you want to preserve what you have or make it look better. And then, finally, let's just talk about the signs and the wonders. You know, people think that revival goes with signs and wonders and this is happening and that is happening and so we flock to that. I too, many years ago, 
drove many hours to what was declared to be a revival. I found out that what was called a revival and millions of people passed through that facility that was called a revival. I found out that it was even worse in that it was for many reasons and for many leading that. It was a money-making system that they would hound you and not let go of you once they had your number to solicit funds out of you. Oh man, that's not revival. That's how man-made ministry looks like. And we'll use any term and we'll do any gimmicks and we'll rehash the same old thing, warm it up, even though it's dead, we'll just keep warming it up and tell people this is God. That's not revival. So it's not about science. In fact, Matthew 16 verse 4 says, it's a wicked and adulterous generation that demands science. If you're looking for science, you're looking for wonders, you're looking for a show, you're looking for manifestation of stuff, then you run the danger of your heart being wicked and that you will be deceived. In fact, going back to Israel now, in Deuteronomy 1 verse 35, speaking to Israel, says, Not one of the men of this evil generation shall see the good land that I swore to give your fathers. So God is saying, when there's evil hearts, wickedness in the hearts, deceitfulness in the hearts, when there's something that is not seeking truth earnestly, but seeking other things amongst other signs and wonders. You run the risk of missing everything. Because what you're going after, the enemy, the enemy will make sure he caters for it. In fact, the enemy is a master of manipulating to impress you in your soul and to appease the things that your soul lusts for. And so let's see how the enemy does it. Second Thessalonians 2 verse 8 to 12 says, The coming of the lawless one will be accompanied by the working of Satan with every kind of power, sign, and false wonder. And with every wicked, there we see the word again, wicked deception directed against those who are perishing because they refuse the love of the truth that would have saved them for this reason god will send them a powerful delusion so that they believe the lie in order that judgment may come upon all who have disbelieved the truth and delighted in wickedness wickedness here again wickedness is connected in the previous verse to a generation seeking signs so be careful what impresses you. There's so much soulish things that are going on in what is called the church. In these gatherings and in these denominations, in these meetings, that has hyped up flesh, impressing soulish men that are impressed by soulish manifestations. The sons of God are not impressed by soulish manifestations. They are seekers of the truth. So revival, whether it's a personal revival in your own life or amongst a grouping of people, it is to bring a newness of life into the situation, a new form of life into the situation. You must be willing to let go of everything that you once held to and defended because Christ wants to produce his life in us. His life is the life that flows out of the resurrection life. The Apostle Paul referred to it as the out of resurrection life. Not just the resurrection life, but the out of resurrection life. The ex anastasis. Which means that we live out of the resurrection life of Christ. Christ. His resurrection life is the life we live out of. 
So it's not just going to heaven, being resurrected from the dead, receiving glorified bodies. It's not that. It's how we live here on the earth is out of this newness of life, out of the resurrection life. And it looks different. It looks very different from the form of life that we were trying to preserve that is certifiably dead. And so John, 20, John 4 verse 23 and 24 again reminds us, as Jesus was speaking to the woman at the well, he says, a time is coming and now come when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Again, the seeking for truth at all costs. No matter what I have to lose, no matter what I have to give up, I'm seeking truth. For the Father is seeking such as these to worship Him. God is spirit. And His worshippers must worship Him in spirit and in truth. Remember when Jesus spoke these words, He was referring to, answering a question that the Samaritan woman was asking, where should we worship? We Samaritans worship there on this mountain, and the Jews worship there on this mountain. We in this church, and you in that church. We of this denomination, and you in this, that denomination. You of this institution, and we of this institution. We have these traditions, they have those traditions, and Jesus is saying it's none of that. None of that. It's not that, not here, not there, not on this mountain, not in that institution, not in that building, not in that set of beliefs. It is in spirit and in truth. And he brings it straight down to in Christ, the resurrection and the life. Those seekers of truth will experience what God is doing as he brings a new form of life. You don't even have to pray for revival because you are seeking his life. And the life that you now live is a different life than you lived when you were dead in your traditions and religious systems. It is not a life that uh, is dictated by boards and, and church doctrines. It is a life that is dictated by by the communion that you have with the living God, by His Spirit. It is a life that is dictated by real relationships where people are encouraging you in your walk with the Lord, holding you accountable, yes, but speaking life into you as you pursue Christ being formed in you. That life looks nothing like the life we've been trying to preserve. And God is doing that. God doesn't call it revival. He doesn't say go and look after this and look for that and seek after that and drive to that because you go to get it. No, you get it in your seeking. Those who seek to worship God in spirit and in truth. And God is going to produce His life in you. It's a newness of life. It is Christ, His resurrection life, now producing Christ in you, God being put on display through you. This is what the sons of God are pursuing. We don't run there and we don't run there. We don't go to this meeting and go to that meeting and looking for the next preacher and the next prophet and the next word and the next miracle crusade. Those things are childish pursuits, soulish. Soulish in their design from the leaders that design them to entice people to come to their gatherings to feed into their system and soulish for those that flock to it thinking that in that they're going to find life god says he has a newness of life for you god bless you as you hopefully are encouraged as a seeker of truth as one born of the spirit sons of god coming to maturity as god is producing his life in us. God bless you.